Whenever someone is talking about buying a computer, they're usually referring to building a computer to save some money, purchasing a pre-built from an OEM to save some time and effort, or possibly even hitting up the used market to get some deals on some last-gen parts. But what about this? The Raspberry Pi. Well, to be precise, this is a Raspberry Pi 4 inside a Fleer, Fleer, however you say that, Cody Edition case. But the pie is there. You smell that? It smells like a bit goblin. So those of you already familiar with the Raspberry Pi probably already know that no. Unfortunately, this thing will not actually compete with a fully fledged gaming rig and nor will it really compete with any modern system if you're looking for a super snappy experience with lots of heavy applications and multitasking. In other words, it's not going to replace a typical computer for most tasks, but that's not really the point of this thing. But before we get into that, let's take a closer look at this thing. Like your average computer, the Pi has a processor to compute tasks, RAM for quick and temporary storage, some sort of permanent storage device, I.O. to connect your computer to things, and, of course, a motherboard to tie it all together. However, What's different from most computers compared to this is this is what's known as a single board computer, or SBC for short, meaning that all those components, which are usually individual components, each with their own PCBs, that can be slotted or pieced together, are actually all a part of the same PCB. Really? Unfortunately, this does affect the upgradability of the Pi, since you can't just take out and swap the RAM or the processor. But considering this thing is so cheap and software compatibility between newer and older versions of the Pi is actually really good. Upgrading the whole computer when you need a more powerful chip really isn't that big of a problem since it just doesn't cost that much. Taking a look at the specs now. <coughs> the latest version of the Raspberry Pi is currently the Raspberry Pi 4, which features an ARM Cortex A53 quad core processor clocked at 1.5 gigahertz either 1, 2, 4, or 8 gigabytes of RAM, the same SD card slot that was found on the previous versions of the Pi, and a USB Type-C port for power, which is a nice upgrade from the micro-USB port featured on said previous versions. As for IL, you have a gigabit Ethernet port, two USB 3.0 and two USB 2.0 ports, a 3.5mm headphone jack for audio, two micro HDMI ports for display, and a built-in combined Wi-Fi and Bluetooth chip. A couple things to note here are the Gigabit Ethernet port this time around is able to fully saturate a Gigabit connection as opposed to on the Pi 3B Plus, the USB 2.0 bus that the Ethernet port was connected via was only able to hit around 300 to 350 megabits per second in the best of scenarios. Also, the micro HDMI ports aren't quite the same as you need to use HDMI 0, the one closest to the power connector, to use a 4K 60fps display. Now, for the software side of things, which is just as important as the hardware, you will need to run an operating system that was built for the ARM architecture, which, in this case, is primarily dominated by Linux distributions like Debian and Ubuntu, but there are also builds of FreeBSD, NetBSD, and also Windows 10 that can run on the Pi if you look in the right places. Conveniently, the Raspberry Pi Foundation provides an OS dubbed Raspberry Pi OS, formerly known as Raspbian, which is basically just an ARM build of Debian with some hardware-specific tweaks for the Pi. Once you've gotten an OS installed, most software that you normally run should have some sort of ARM build for it, although that isn't always the case, and Google Chrome, of all things, is a big example of such. You can run Chromium in place of Google Chrome, but it's not quite the same, and yeah. This leads us very well into the price of the Pi, and like I said earlier, it's pretty cheap. On the screen right now is a chart of the variations of the Pi 4 with their associated prices, and also including last generation's Pi 3B Plus for comparison. The main thing to note here is Raspberry Pi Foundation's consistency in keeping around the $35 price point for the base model while still improving their hardware. Do note that initially, the 1GB and 2GB RAM versions were released at $35 and $45 each, but the prices were later reduced to what you see on the chart. Honestly, it really is impressive how far technology has come 
to not only be able to build a functional computer in such a small form factor, and if you want even smaller, you can look at the Raspberry Pi Zero, which is the size of a stick of gum, but also still be able to improve performance in a reasonable time frame, which is about once every year or two. That really is a lot to pack into such a small package, which can be had for as little as $30, depending on how much RAM you need and any accessories that you purchase, such as a case, SD card, power supply, whatever else. Conveniently though, there are tons of bundles with some common accessories for the Pi available to purchase, like this one from Kanakit featuring the Raspberry Pi 4 with 1 gig of RAM for $60, and also this one from Kanakit featuring the Raspberry Pi 4 gig with a 64 gig SD card and a bunch of other stuff for $115. It's really not a bad deal. So that's all good and dandy, right? But what's the point of this thing? Like I said earlier, this really isn't going to replace your daily driver machine, unless you're extremely patient and understand the limitations of this thing. And that's all due to a few things, like the low power processor that, while it is quad-core, isn't hyper-threaded, which can help with some of the smaller tasks, and is only clocked at 1.5 GHz. The limited amount of RAM also affects the applications that you can run, unless you pay up for the 4 or 8 GB versions. And even then, it's still rather limited depending on your use case. Hello, Chrome! And, most importantly, the SD card storage is still a problem for performance. You can boot off a USB drive on the Pi, but it is a bit kludgy, and if you stick to the more supported SD card boot device, it can just be slow as molasses, even slower than a typical hard drive in a lot of cases. Instead, devices like this are targeted at makers to be used in robotics as controllers. Although I'm personally not too familiar with this stuff, or IoT applications since these are such low power devices, networks, and can very easily run things like clocks, control lights, or do some more advanced things like being a weather station and even monitoring and controlling sensors around your house. In fact, I know one of the guys that I've met at work uses a Raspberry Pi to automatically water his plants. That's pretty cool, right? These can also be used in slightly more conventional use cases for things like a media player with apps like Kodi, running lighter awake network services like DNS, NTP, and even a backup server with an external hard drive, and even game streaming with Valve's Steam Link, all three of which are things that I personally do in my home. However, you can use these things for many other kinds of projects. I recently stumbled upon this neat little Power Over Ethernet module for the Raspberry Pi 3B Plus that lets you power your Pi with just a network cable. So, now I'm thinking about trying to make a wireless access point out of the Pi, this Power Over Ethernet module, and probably some 3D printing in an attempt to make something similar to an ubiquity wireless access point. I have also been thinking about trying to create a fully functional Linux tablet with the Raspberry Pi and a touchscreen, since th there aren't any tablets out there that really do it for me. All in all, if you need some ideas for how to use these things, or even just some help setting up a Pi, there's a little website called raspberrypi.org that has plenty of great resources to help you get started. So, should you buy this thing? That answer depends on your situation. No, if you're looking for a general daily di driver computer, unless your budget is like super tight, though I would still then suggest to try and save a little bit more for something a bit more powerful off the used market. But if you have a specific use case that this would be great for, like a media machine running Kodi, or if you're just a tinkerer and want to play with something cool that doesn't add a huge load to your power bill, then this is a great buy. That's actually going to wrap it up for this video, and I hope you enjoyed it. If you'll like the video, subscribe to the channel, watch one of the videos down below, or just do whatever it is you need to do to make yourself feel happy. Either way, I will catch you in the next one.